Welcome to Glory Stories with Dr. Elizabeth Vaughn. Dr. Vaughn was one of the top eye surgeons in America and has traveled to many countries in the world preaching the Word of God. She also opened up an eye surgery center in Beijing, China, where she did free eye surgery on those in need. Dr. Vaughn will be sharing many of her personal experiences from God. In addition, you will hear of others that have known God in an intimate way and seen His miracle working power. As you hear about how God has worked in the lives of others, our hope is that you will be changed forever. Get ready for God to heal you, deliver you, and transform your life as you sit back and enjoy these glory stories. Welcome to Glory Stories. Today I'm going to take you to the far western part of China and tell you some very interesting experience that I, that I lived through. Uh, I, had, I had four people with me on this particular trip. I had a lady named Lulu and her husband, uh, Austin, an, another lady named Doreen, another lady named Jerry, and myself. There were five of us. And so we flew from Beijing to Lanzhou, which is in the western part of China. And then we, we had to get on a train to get to this very remote place, six-hour train ride. The name of the place was or is Gangu, Gangu. So we got to Gangu. They don't have any hotel or motel facilities at all. It's very remote. So they put us in a dormitory, which didn't have any hot water, but it did have cold water. So at least it had water. That was good. So the next day was going to be my only day to do surgery in Gangu. So when I arrived at the hospital, the, the halls were absolutely jammed with people. I mean j jammed. They had walked into, this, into Gangu from miles and miles around, walked from the mountains, from the villages, from everywhere. You know, I, 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 I understood that really because they somehow heard that I was going to be there and be doing eye surgery on as many people as I could in one day. And I'm sure many of those people were blind and didn't have any hope of ever seeing again. And that hopelessness was at least dispelled for a little while by a spark of hope that maybe I could do surgery on them and do something about their eye situation, make them see again. So they were desperate. Some of these people were totally desperate. And so the, the hallways were just jammed, packed with people. And so they led me into this little tiny room, uh, the examination room. I can't even, it's, it's very small. I don't know, seven by seven maybe feet. Anyways, very small room, had a, a, a slit lamp, which is an examination uh, equipment. And so I started examining patients to see I was going to do cataract surgery as much as I could. Well, I mean, everybody I saw needed to have surgery. So I had a long, long list, and I knew I couldn't do all of those patients in the time that I had. So I told the, I told the uh, Chinese people in charge, I said, you need to tell the, the, the people to, to, to go home, to go away, because I can't do any more surgery. So they really made no headway telling people to leave. Meanwhile, the thought occurred to me, I had the suitcase that I brought from America that had the intraocular lenses, the suture material, the medication, everything that I needed to do eye surgery that I could carry, I had with me in this suitcase. However, there was one problem. The key to the suitcase was back in the dormitory room where we had spent the night the night before. So I asked Jerry and Austin, to go back and get the key to the suitcase and, and bring it back to me so that I could have the supplies to do the surgery with. Well, I went on and examined pe people, people as long as I could. And in a little while, here came Jerry and Austin. Jerry's face was just as white as a sheet and she was shaking, visibly shaking like this. And she stood over by the, the window. We were on the third floor of this hospital building. She stood over by the window and she kept looking out the window and looking out the window, and so in a little while I said, Jerry, why are you keep, why do you keep looking out the window? She said, because, and she was serious. She said, I'm trying to decide if these people, if this mob out here gets out of control, will I have a better chance of surviving if I jump out of the third story window or if I go back out there into the crowd, which would give me the best chance of surviving? And she was dead serious about it. She was visibly shaken because when they, when Austin, and Jerry were trying to get back into the examination room. The crowd was so, you know, bumping and 
crowding and trying to get to the door. If the door opened a little crack, they'd try to push it open. As many people as could would flood into the room. So they had jammed Jerry up against the wall. And if, if Austin hadn't been with her to protect her, she might have gotten very badly injured in that situation. So she was, she was just shaking. She was just shaking. So she said she figured out a plan. She said, I'm going to pretend like I'm sick and let Austin take me back to the dormitory. So she pretended like she was sick, so the people kind of let her go through. She went back to the dormitory with Austin, and he looked after her while the rest of us, the other three of us, one was my scrub nurse, one was my circulating nurse, and, and myself, the three of us. Uh, of course, we couldn't, we couldn't get out of the room either. But when I, So I got up, you know, the people would not disperse. So finally, I stood up on a chair. I'm not tall enough to talk to the whole crowd in the whole hospital hall. So I stood up on a chair, and I tried to motion to them, you know, go, go home, go away. Well, they wouldn't do that either. They didn't. They ignored me. So finally, I just uh, got the suitcase, and I just decided I'm just going to walk right out there, right through the middle of them, because I've got to get to surgery, which I did. I walked right out through the middle of them, pulling that suitcase behind me, and they just parted. They just parted. They just parted. And I walked right through the middle of them, went right to surgery. So the first thing I wanted to see was the operating microscope, because everything we do is through an operating microscope. It's microsurgery. It's like in, in microns. Measurements in microns is what we do. I said, where is your operating microscope? I mean, I had kind of assumed, well, you, in order to do eye surgery, you've got to have a microscope. Where is your microscope? They said, oh, well, it's over there in the corner somewhere. It's covered up. I said, well. They said, we haven't used it in about 10 years. I said, you haven't used it. Why haven't you used it? They said, because we can't see through it. Now my heart sunk, because how can I do surgery if I don't have a microscope? I mean, it's just not a doable thing for me. So I said, well, bring it over here anyway. Let me look through the thing. So they bring it out. I look through it, and it was as if someone had taken Vaseline or axle grease something like that, and smeared it over all the lenses in that microscope. That's the way it looked. That's the way it looked. So you look in through the microscope where you're supposed to be seeing the pristine anatomy of the eyeball, and instead you just see a big globby, globby, smeared mess. You can't start to see anything. So I, I really was faced with a, a difficult decision then because I either canceled the day's worth of surgery and all those people would go home despondent, and I for sure wouldn't help anybody, or else I could just proceed with the surgery and do the best that I could with that horrible, horrible microscope. So I decided I would just do the best that I could, and I'd pray and ask God to help me, which God certainly needed to help me in that circumstance. Then I asked him, show me your suture that you do, you know, suturing with surgery, sewing up with surgery, show me your suture. What kind do you have? They said, we have either black or white. I said, OK, show it to me. So they, they show me their suture. And it's like, I don't know, if you were going to go deep sea fishing, you might, you might use that as, <laughs> as a line to go fishing. I mean, it's not anything that we would dream of using for eye surgery in America. So by the grace of God, I had some beautiful 10-0 nylon suture in my suitcase. And I got that out. And, and, I, and I had my instruments. And I had this. The, the, I had what I needed as far as medicine and equipment. I just, I just didn't have a microscope. But I, I had a microscope, but I already explained to you what it looked like. So we start doing the cases. I'm telling you. Well, I, at that point, I had had about 26 years of experience doing eye surgery. And if it hadn't been for my experience, I would have no clue what at all I was looking at. But I knew where things were supposed to be in the eye. And so I did the best that I could with the circumstance that I had and prayed an awful lot. I didn't do a very good job because I couldn't see. But I did the best that I, that I think any human being could do under those circumstances. And I did surgery as, as much as I can all day long, all day long, all day long. And then there was when I had worked all day long, and there was one patient. And she kept saying, it was a little Chinese lady, smaller than me, and I'm not very tall. She was smaller than me. She kept saying, sister, sister, sister. Well, I didn't know what sister means. You know, I don't speak Chinese. I thought she was speaking in Chinese. Someone said, she's trying to say that she's a Catholic nun, a sister, a, a, a Catholic sister. So I said, well, OK. 
despite the fact that my whole surgery schedule is filled, I said, we'll put her, we'll just go and put her in anyway. So Sista was the last patient that I operated on that day. And again, I just did the best that I could. When I came out of operating with Sista, it was now 9.30 at night. And there was a whole bunch of patients still waiting for me to see them. They knew I couldn't do surgery, but they just wanted me to see them and see if there's anything I could say or do or help them in any way. So I, I stayed there and I saw those patients and talked to them and helped them the best that I could. By now, it was, a, it was about midnight when I got back to the dormitory. dormitory. It was a dormitory for workers, you know, construction crew kind of dormitory workers. Anyway, I got back there around midnight, and I found out that they were now waiting on me. The dignitaries from the whole area were waiting on me to get back because they had uh, a, a banquet prepared for me to thank me for coming to Gangu, for helping their, pay, their people. And, and so now it was midnight. Those dignitaries had been waiting for hours and hours and hours and hours for me to finish seeing patients to come to the banquet. So now I go to the banquet. And they gave, they gave us the very best that they could. I remember one of the things on the menu that night was grass from the mountaintop, or the mountainside, rather, grass from the mountainside. They gave us gifts, lovely gifts. They, they're so warm and loving. I mean, you, you just have to fall in love with these people. It seems like the more rural, rural you get, the more simple they are and the more grateful they are for everything that you can do for them. So I left Gangu with a heart that was partially sad because I knew that if I had had the right equipment, I could have done such a better job for those people. And it gave me, it gave me a little glimpse into what the eye surgeons in the rural areas were faced with because if that's the equipment they have to deal with, they can't do a very good job, even if they're good surgeons. They can't, if you can't see, you can't do eye surgery. You have to be able to see into the inside of the eyeball to be able to take cataracts out and do the microsurgery we do. You have to be able to see. It reminds me of a scripture the Lord says, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. If you can't see the truth, there's no way that you're going to be set free. And Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Well, that was our experience in Gangu. Then we had to get back on the, the train to go from the train back to Lanzhou, and then from Lanzhou back to Beijing, China, where we could do good surgery because at Glory Eye Center we had excellent equipment there. Thank God for that. Well, uh, there's another interesting episode that ends up being kind of funny because at, at one point in time, they were going to celebrate us and, and thank us for helping. Not, I'm not talking about Gangu. I'm talking about back in Beijing. They wanted to, to thank us for all we're doing for their people and so forth. So they had this, this lovely night uh, prepared where there was food, there was music, they did uh, a disco, a disco. You know, it has a round ball with mirrors all over the ball, little mirrors, and they shine a light on it, and so it wrote, the ball rotates, and it makes little sparkles of light go all around the room, and that's the setting for this. And so they start playing all this music, and so they want to they wanna dance, and so they ask me to come. Well, I, I don't know how to do this dance, you know. I don't. I don't know how to do this dance, but they wouldn't take no for an answer, and I'm the guest of honor, and so I, I try to, you know, I try to do the best that I can with it. So I'm thinking, I don't know any, I don't know how to dance this dance at all. So I have a thought, a thought comes to my mind. Back in America, I'd been to revivals, and they, they, had, a, they had a song back then about the river, swimming in the river, swimming in the river. And when you sang this song, you did swimming motions, you know, you breaststroke, you do, bre you do the backstroke, you do all these swimming moves in, in while you're dancing in the river, the river of God. It's the river that comes out from underneath the throne of God. It's talked about in Ezekiel 47th chapter. And in this river, there is life because God is in this, this, this river. God is in this river. It says, God is in her midst, and she shall not be moved. And so anyway, it's a, happy, it's a happy dance to a happy song about the river of God. So that comes to my mind on this disco dance floor in China. So I'm thinking, okay, 
I'll just dance in God's river. They won't, they won't know what I'm doing. So, okay, so I start, I start, you know, dancing in the river. I'm having myself a good time. <laughs> Uh, two other ladies that had been to America and been to Revival, boy, they, they see me doing this. They understand what I'm doing. They start swimming in the river, you know, backstroke and all this. So, so the Chinese see me doing this dancing in the river stuff. They don't know it's dancing in the river. They just think this must be a new American dance, you know. So this is cool. This is what she's doing is really cool, you know, on the cutting edge of American dancing. <laughs> so th they start dancing too, you know. A guy comes over and he starts doing this with me and he <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, but this was hilarious. So they all start <laughs> doing these dances. We had, we ended up having a ball. I had a ball. That's the most fun I ever had in China was do, <laughs> dancing in the river in the middle of a disco dance floor. So that was a wonderful experience. That's kind of in contrast to Gangu. So I left you with a, a bad experience. I'm giving you a good one now. I want to tell you about a man that I met over there. He's a Catholic priest. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assign a name to him and call him Father Wu. That wasn't his real name, but I'm going to call him that because he was a very, very bright man. He was so bright he could speak like seven languages. He can read and write seven languages. And they thought he was so bright and such an upcoming star that they sent him from China to the Vatican to train him for a higher position in Catholicism. And while he was in the Vatican, bad times broke out back in, in China where he was from. And so his heart was to go back to China and help his people. That's what he wanted to do. They warned him in the Vatican, don't you go back there. You'll be arrested. You'll probably be killed because they were killing intellectuals back then and they were killing Christians back then. And so they warned him, don't go back. But he said, I have to go back. My sheep, my people, they need me. I have to go back. So he went back to China against advice. And when he got back, you know, the authorities found out that he spoke and, and read and, and wrote seven languages, and they think this man is too valuable just to kill him. So they put him in solitary confinement. He, couldn't, he didn't have the Bible. He didn't have any reading material. He didn't have any people around him to, to talk with. Solitary confinement. Guess how long? 25 years in solitary confinement. I said to him, how did you survive that from a spiritual standpoint? He had memorized the book of John before he ever went into prison. So he, he had the book of John inside of him, the whole book of John. That's a challenge for some of us to learn a few scriptures. He's learned the whole book of John. And so during the 25 years, he had that whole word of God to feed upon all the time, the whole book of John. It sustained him for 25 years. And when he came out of that prison, and I met him when he got out of that prison, when the, uh, the, when the society changed and they were letting prisoners out, they let him out. And, you know, if you, if you hadn't asked or been told by somebody, you'd never know the man was in solitary confinement for 25 years. He was, he was happy. He was joyful. He never spoke of sorrow. He never spoke of agony. He never spoke of anything that would be negative. He, all, he just had a positive attitude toward everything, and he was so happy to be serving God, whether it was in, in solitary confinement or out in the world. He, he was serving God. Either way, he was living in the presence of the Lord. That man, Father Wu, and the way he responded to 25 years of solitary confinement reminded me of a story out of the Bible. And so I thought I'd read it to you. Some of you are going to be familiar with it, and some of you have never heard it before. So we're going to all share it together right now. It's out of the book of Daniel, and it's about three Hebrew men named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. There's a reason I want to share this with you. It reminds me of this Father Wu. Uh, it happens in Babylon because uh, the nation of Israel was taken captive by the Babylonian army. And so the king of Babylon was named King Nebuchadnezzar, and that's where this story starts. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn and the pipe and all the ever other kind of instruments shall fall down and worship the golden image. So get this picture. King Nebuchadnezzar had set up a golden image. When all these musical instruments were played, everybody was supposed to fall down and worship this golden image. 
And whosoever does not fall down in worship shall be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews among you you've appointed and set over the affairs of the province of Babylon. Their names Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image which you have set up. So they refused because they worship God, the real God, the one and only God, and they refused to bow down to this golden image. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, commanded to bring these three people to him, and they were brought to the king. And the king says to them, If you do not worship, when I play these instruments, have them played, you shall be cast at once into the midst of a fiery furnace. And who is it, what God is it, that can deliver you out of my hands? He thinks he could... He'd be superior to God's. And this was their answer. They answered, O King Nebuchadnezzar, it's not necessary for us to answer you on this point. If our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, he will deliver us out of your hand, O King. If not, be it be known to you, O King, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury and his facial expression was changed to antagonism against these men. Therefore, he commanded that the furnace should be heated seven times hotter than it usually was heated. And he commanded that the strongest men in his army bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the burning furnace. Then these three men were bound in their coats, their tunics, their undergarments, their turbans, all their clothing. They were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame and the sparks from the fire killed those men who handled Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So the fire was so hot that the men who threw them in there died of the fire themselves. And these three men fell down, bound into the burning fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king saw and was astonished. He jumped up. And he said to his counselors, he looked in the fiery furnace. He said, did we not cast three men bound in the midst of the fire? They answered, yes, true, O king. He answered, lo, but I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they're not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like a son of the gods. The fourth one that he saw was Jesus in the furnace, fire, fiery furnace with these three men. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace, and he said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you servants of the Most High God. Listen to how his tune changed. Now, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then they came out from the midst of the fire. And all the deputies and the governors and the king's counselors being gathered together saw these men, that the fire had no power upon their bodies nor was their hair of their head singed, neither were their garments scorched or changed in color or condition, nor had even the smell of smoke clung to them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants, who believed and trusted in and relied on him, and they set aside the king's command and yielded their bodies rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree that my people, nation, and language that speaks anything amiss against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut into pieces, and their houses shall be made dunghills, for there is no other god that can deliver in this way. How about that? No other god can deliver in this way. The God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is the only God. And then he took these three men and he promoted them to high positions in the province of Babylon. The reason that that reminds me of, of Father Wu is because he came out of prison as if nothing had happened to him for 25 years. Just like these three Hebrew men came out of the fiery furnace with no clothes singed, no hair singed, no, no sign of fire on them at all. And in addition, they didn't even smell of smoke. Now, 
what, what does that have to do with you and me? What does that have to do with us? This is what it has to do. Because you see and hear people all around you, and maybe it's you. And what they do is just complain and complain and complain and talk about all the things that are wrong in their lives, the lives of their children, the lives of their grandchildren, what's wrong with their car, what's wrong with their house, what's wrong with the people in church, what's wrong with... They complain all the time about everything. And here these people in a burning furnace with Jesus don't have any complaints, don't have even the smell of smoke on them. In other words, the tribulation they had gone through, these men, in addition to Father Wu, the tribulation they had gone through didn't phase them. It didn't phase them. That's the way we need to be. If we can walk through our lives with Jesus Christ and He is there with you, whether you realize it or not, if you've asked Him into your heart, His promise is He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. So no matter what kind of traumatic situation that you get into, and a lot of times we get into those situations because of our own doing, because of things we did or things we said or the kind of person we were. And we get them into them ourselves. But no matter what situations we get into, with Jesus there, we can be just like these three men. The fire can be burning all around us. I mean, I, I have experienced this in life circumstances, not a literal flame, but life circumstances can be horrendous sometimes. But as you're walking in that and through that, if you will keep your eyes focused on Jesus and trust Him and rely on Him, didn't He say, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, whether it's a physical death or a death, a financial death or whatever kind of death it is that you're walking through, He says that He is our shepherd, and the, the good thing about the word through is it means, yes, you go into it and you go through it, but it also means you come out on the other end of it. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because thou art with me. Because you're with me. So whatever circumstance that I've had in life or you've had in life, walking through it with Jesus, you know for sure you're going to come out on the other end and that he has a way of taking bad things and turning them around and making them work for your good. That's the way that I've seen him do that time and time and time again. So when a bad thing happens, I always think of that. It's Romans 8, 28. And, and it says that he takes a bad thing and he can turn it right around and make it for good in your life. So bottom line on it is we need to walk with Jesus every day, trust in him, rely on Him, depend on Him, and know that He will bring us out of the other end of that trial. And we should be acting as if we have no smoke on us when we come out. We hope that you enjoyed these stories of the glory of God. We believe that each story we tell will help build your faith and help to bring a miracle into your life. For more information about this program and Dr. Elizabeth Vaughn, visit her website at godsinstrument.com her YouTube channel at Glory Stories Now or write her at Elizabeth Vaughn Ministries Incorporated, P.O. Box 454, Argyle, Texas 76226, USA.